Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and Happy New Year to everyone. Hard to believe we're in a new year already, 2023. For some of you with great memories, 52 weeks ago, do you remember what I preached on? <laughs> I found my notes. It was predestination, so you must have really listened a lot then. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> So I probably could have preached it again. You might not have remembered it, but uh, no, I wouldn't do that to you. But uh, praise God, it's an amazing. I was just thinking about this before I came out this morning. Uh, for us, a new year is a new beginning and all kinds of things. And I'm going to talk about that in the message. But what about God, who's not affected by time or calendars? What does it do for him? You wonder. He knows already what's going to happen this year before we get there. And to me, that's a bit of excitement to know that our God already has a plan and he's going to work it to his honor and glory. Anyway, that's something to think about. Before I get there, though, I was finishing my yearly reading through the Bible. Thank God for that opportunity to do that. And I came across um, Revelation 21, 6. It says, and he said to me, Jesus' words, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Wow. That's an amazing God, isn't it? And we usually see Alpha and Omega together, don't we? The first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And on its own, Omega means the one who ushers in the new heavens and the new earth. So that's worth celebrating as we usher in a new year. And of course, I can't forget, forget the other one. In Revelation 1.8, Jesus again says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. By the way, both those words are capitalized when you think about it. He's the beginning and the end because he's eternal. No beginning, no end. That's pretty amazing too when you think about it. Says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So here, Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. So Jesus says, oh, over the very beginnings of our lives, today is his completely. And he originates and creates all we need to start, start our journey on the new year. Okay? I just want to give that a little boost before we got going this morning. Because when we think about it in 2023, will we see the face of God? You say, well, that's an interesting question because... In Genesis 33, 20, Jacob said this. Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Isn't that great? So when we get to see God, when that time comes, our life will be preserved just like he said there. Someone once said, don't know who said it, time writes no wrinkle on the brow of the eternal Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today for a beginning of a new year. And for you, Lord, it's, it's nothing new. You are always have been, as we've already addressed a bit in your own words from Revelation. And it's, it's what we see in Scripture now uh, from the epistle of Jude, Lord, I think it would be good for us today to, to be in the house of the Lord. I'm so glad that we have this place to be together and we can fellowship together. And that part of our fellowship is part of the love of Christ that makes us a body and gives us the opportunity to serve you. While wow, there's so much, so much that we could say, but we many times there are words that just don't really properly give you the glory that you deserve. But we so far have tried with singing, with our smiles, with just our presence today. We ask you to come in our presence. We ask you to use this speaker's lips to speak the truth in love. May Christ be glorified in the Lord today. And our goal is to look forward into this new year, not with fear and trepidation, but with excitement to know that you know each day before it comes, and you know what we can take, what we can't, and you know what trials we're going to face and how we're going to react. But may Christ be lifted up. We thank you for what you do, and there are many hearts and souls today that have prayers on their hearts and family and friends and people they know that are struggling and they're lost out there that need the gospel life. So the Lord may be, as a body of Grace Baptist Church, be a light, a beacon to show that love this year and be about your heartbeat. 
getting the gospel out there. So, Lord, we love you. Thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Open your Bibles with me to the epistle of Jude. You'll find it just before Revelation 26, the Bible, the New Testament, right? 27, I think, last time I checked. Um, and it's, it's an amazing, you know, I would say turn to chapter, but I don't have to because it's all one chapter, right? So we got that down. Um, but if you were to, to give some words to this book by way of introduction, you could say fight, right? You could say contend. You could say do battle. You, you could say, because when apostasy arises, when false teachers emerge, when the truth of God is attacked, it's time to fight for the faith. We have that problem today in South Africa. There's not a lot of truth being preached out there today. Not like you get from our pastor in this church and, and, and our Sunday school curriculum and, and our desire to do the will of God. Because we're more concerned about what God says about things than what we think or what the world's views are, right? We're going we're gonna to see how that fits today with what's going on. So um, the author of Jude that's been suspected, you know, a lot of people said, well, it's not the apostle, uh, the apostle Jude, but it would have been uh, the author himself identifies himself as a servant of Christ. Look at verse 1. Uh, it says here, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and Brother of James. Okay, so that gives us some in information here, doesn't it? Uh, this de designation combined with the reference in verse 17 to the apostles makes it unlikely that this is the apostle Jude called the Jude, Judas, the son of James, in Luke 16 and Acts 1.13. This leaves the traditional view that Jude was one of the Lord's brothers called Judas in Matthew 13.55 and Mark 6.3. And uh, we know that his older brother James... Um, no, uh, uh, was the famous leader of the Jer of Jerusalem church, Acts 15, we find that. And the author of the epistle bears his name. So um, interesting enough, like his other brothers, he didn't believe in the Lord Jesus until after his resurrection. So that's noted. And in, in, um, the only other biblical allusion name, I found this interesting, was 1 Corinthians 9, 5, when it's recorded that the brothers of the Lord took their wives along their missionary journeys. That's good. I brought my wife on my missionary journey, too. <laughs> She's been a great help. This year, by God's grace, we'll make it to June 23rd. It'll be 45 years. Praise God. Um, so anyway, we don't find any, a lot of extra biblical A's that gives us any, anything more to the limited knowledge of Jude. But um, let's just say the time that this writing was done, general address does not really mark out any particular circle of readers uh, or any geographical restrictions, we could say. But nevertheless, it probably had in mind a specific region that was being troubled by false teachers. And today, that could be said all around the world. That this is a problem, just like it was back in their day. All right? Um, when we talk about Christ and what he wants us to get about Christ, in contrast to those who stand condemned to their licentiousness and the denial of Christ, which he, he mentions in verse 4, the believers preserved in Jesus Christ, as he said here in verse 1. Jude tells his readers to keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the, the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, eternal life. Verse 21, that's one of the ones we're going to get to. But at the same time, the Lord is able to keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And that's one of the finest benedictions you'll find in the Bible to the end of this book. Verse 24. So the key word is contend for the faith. The key verse is verse 3. Look at it with me. It says, Blessed, our beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in and now and long ago were marked out that there's condemnation on godly men who turn the grace of our God and to licentiousness and deny it our only Lord and God, uh, uh, Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I alluded to that a minute in the introduction. But um, then he begins to talk about the past judgment of false teachers and he begins to present the characteristics of those teachers. And But then he mentions future judgment of the false teacher. He mentions Enoch here in verse 14. He talks about his part in that. But I want to I move up to the defense against the teachers in verse 17. 
It says, but you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that in 2 Peter 3, 2 also mentions that. So I think he, this is a, a, an interesting com- connection here. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. Do we see that today, beloved? Man, do we see that today. I mean, it's it was starting then, but it's certainly gotten a lot worse these many years later, right? How they told you that there would be mockers last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons, or you could say soulish or worldly, who cause divisions not having the spirit. Now, our, our focus today will be in the next two verses. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others have a save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the government, defiled by the flesh, and then here's this great doxology we know. Now to him who's able to keep you from stumbling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. That's, whew, that says it all, doesn't it? So what I find here in these verses, these two verses, 20 and 21, are four important things that are stressed which go to make up a consistent Christian life. And so for us, we're going to look at the life of faith. We're going to talk about that and how that fits together. So the first one is, he says, is building yourself up on your most holy faith. Now that, that is, I find this a fascinating comment because that is finding edification in the careful study of the Word of God. And that's why we bring you the Word of God from this pulpit. That's why we have Bible studies of the Word of God. That's why we teach the Word of God to our young people so they grow up loving the Bible as the most valued church. Because that's the only thing that really matters. It's eternal. You realize? It's the only thing we have in this world that besides our salvation and souls one to Christ that's eternal. The Word of God is going to be there when God, with God. He didn't leave him when he gave it to us and, and, and canonized it for us and kept it for us. It's still the Word of God. So the faith here, though, is not faith by which we lay hold of God. All right, but the faith which he has revealed for our acceptance, that faith once and for all made known to his saints. Now, I want you to consider Hebrews 12 too. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our what? Faith, right? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, has set down the right hand of the throne of God. And at the end of the service today, we're going to glorify the Lord through this memorial service here as we do on the first of every month. And we're going to start the year left. It's a good year, a good thing to do. But our faith is complete in Jesus, right? And so it is. He is He um, is both the beginning and, and that of our faith. All we need is Jesus, and we can be confident that he will finish God's work in our lives and present us pure and holy before God. Now, let's think with me for a minute. Faith is not a means of getting man's will done in heaven it is the means of getting god's will done on earth and i I hope to demonstrate that as we go what does this life of faith look like well let me let me give you an illustration i just got enjoyed myself (laughs) i know you're gonna like it too after sunday school one morning a mother asked her little girl what she had learned and by the way parents it's a good idea to check with your kids and see what it is they're learning yeah you might get an interesting answer like this girl. So the mother asked, what did you learn in Sunday school? Well, the daughter responded, well, mom, I learned that Moses built this great pontoon bridge across the Red Sea. <laughs> and, and how all these people were, were transported across with tanks and half trucks. Right now the mother's looking like you're looking. And, uh, and then she said, and, and, and as soon as they were across, the bridge was blown up just as the Egyptians were coming across that bridge and they were all drowned in the Red Sea. Whew. Mother took a breath. She, she was amazed. And she asked if that's what the teacher told her. She said, oh, no, no, that's not what the teacher told her. The little girl replied, but you would never have believed what she really said. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the little girl is a lot like a lot of people like us. They think that faith is believing what isn't true. And as for others, faith is a little more than just wishful thinking. Right? So 
think with me, after Jesus claimed to be sent by God, some were seeking to seize him, have come to the conclusion that he was not a good man. Whereas there were others who believed him and they were saying, when the Christ shall come, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? That's John 7, 31. So all the evidence was there. Some chose to believe and others chose not to. People do the same today. All right. You, um, you know, to, to, to live within the will of God, you have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't be in the will of God if we're not in the Lord Jesus Christ. It just has to be the gift. So faith is the operating principle of life. And it is like the means by which we relate to God and carry out his kingdom activity. And, and so just think of the many ways that faith is operative in our life. If you take Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, right? Um, we, we not only are saved by faith, but we also walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. So being found faithful is a prerequisite for ministry. Paul said, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he contended, uh, considered me faithful, putting me into the ministry. 1 Timothy 1, 12. Paul then adds, and the things which you have heard from me in the uh, presence of many witnesses, th these entrusted to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. So really, the quality of any relationship is determined by faith or trust. And most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness, Proverbs 20, verse 6 reminds us, but a faithful man who can find. So you might find this interesting, as I did. The words faith, trust, and belief, faith, trust, and belief, are all the same word in the original language. So the, the man who has faith believes in something. The one who believes also trusts so he doesn't fully, uh, so, uh, or he doesn't truly believe. So if faith, trust, and believe are all the same, then that fits, doesn't it? There's not a concept that looms larger in life, my friends, than faith because what we believe determines how we live. So let's look at three standards of faith which will keep us on the right path if understood and practiced, right? The first one is, Faith is dependent upon its object, right? <coughs> Excuse me. The question is not whether we walk by faith, but what or whom we believe. Everybody walks by faith. It's the operative principle of life I mentioned. So, for instance, we drive our cars by faith. Like when you have a green light here in South Africa, you, you're going to go through the light, the intersection, right? But you hope and have faith that the guy on the other side is not colorblind and the red sign means stop. But it seems just the opposite these days. So <clears throat> I would recommend for one practice this year is you patiently wait a few seconds after your light screen before you go through. Otherwise, you might be in the middle of a section with somebody else trying to use your space. At the same time, you don't want to have a crash. So that red light, green light concept's there. When I was a, a little boy, I lived in a, a neighborhood that had a local... Uh, Mr. Paulson's stores. It's the little shop down, down, down the road. And <clears throat> in those days, <clears throat> excuse me, in those days we used to buy pop, you know what I'm saying, you know, Coca-Cola, all the different brands in the glass bottles. And he, in his store, he had this, he had this cooler box in there that had a sliding lid. Some of you that are old like me know what I'm talking about. Right? And so you go in there and it was like for, for less than 10 cents, and he even charged less if you drank it outside his shop there at the benches and then left him the bottle for deposit. He even gave us a discount on that. So, so I went in there and picked out my favorite one and they had the, cop, the, the, the caps. And so you open that cap. And so, you know, I chugged down that and I, as soon as I took that drink, it was wrong. So I spit it out. I was thankful it was outside. I looked at the bottle, and there's a clear bottle, and they're looking in there, all kinds of junk in the bottom of this thing that got in there when they make this. So that was bad. I never bought that, that flavor again. That will ruin me. All right, I left that one. All right. But now, think about it. Nowadays, we buy sodas out of cans by faith because you can't see what's in the can. <laughs> <laughs> but believe that the manufacturer put it in the can what the label says, right? 
So we already have some beliefs about the world we live in. That's what I'm saying. Whatever we think we may, will make us happy, satisfied, or successful is what constitutes our belief system. So we're walking by faith according to what we already believe. Because we came into the world separated from God because of sin, we learned to live our lives independently from Him. And we were conformed to this world where much of what we learned to believe didn't really have biblical truth. So if you believe that you will only be satisfied by owning things, then you will probably be, never be satisfied. And if, you, if the world system hasn't distorted our faith enough, the new world order, as they call it, has given it several new twists. I mean, today, many operate under the principle that if you believe hard enough, anything can become true. Is that true? <laughs> Wendy says, no, she's been around a while. She knows what she's talking about. That's right. It's not true. But if believing doesn't make it true and not believing doesn't make it not true, <laughs> not believing in hell, for example, doesn't drop the temperature down there one degree. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> we're talking about faith is dependent upon its object. This life of faith, what does it look like? And for 2023, how are we going to do it? We don't create reality in our minds. We are incapable of creating anything. We can, we can creatively... Uh, shove around and rearrange what God has already created, but we are not gods. And to think that we will get what we want if we believe with all our hearts is a faith based upon selfish desires. It, it originates with ourselves. It depends on our own ability to believe. And it's a form of religious self-hypnosis, if you will. It's like the Christian who says, well, I don't believe the Bible, but I have faith. That gets my toes curled. I don't like that. I believe the Bible. You know, I, you know, I don't, but I, but I have faith. For that person, faith is a substitute for knowledge and a compassion for ignorance. What does 2 Timothy 2.15 say? Study means be diligent to show yourself approved unto God. Well, how do we do that? A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And thank God our pastor preaches the word of truth all the time. And he gives us so much that will help us be successful in our, uh, as a Christian, victorious Christian life. If we would just, not just take it in, but put it into practice. Like we read in James earlier. Show me your faith by your works. If it really works. It's going it's to be, it's going to be true. So, um, Yeah. Also in the life of faith, we find that there is the visible and the invisible. All right? Stay with me here. I'm not getting weird. Hope is not wishing, think, wishful thinking. Is what I'm saying. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence or conviction is another way to look at that, of things not seen. That's Hebrews 11.1. That's Bible. All right? So that's how we get it. Hope is the present assurance of some future good. Biblical faith is not a preference for what we would like to see, but a conviction that what is unseen is real. You remember after the resurrection of our Lord? The first group of guys saw him. He didn't, you know, he didn't knock on the door. He just came through the locked door. That's a bit scary. And then the next time, uh, Jan, uh, Apostle Thomas wasn't there, right? But he had made a comment to everybody. I'm not going to believe until I can put my hands in the nail prints of his hand and put my fist in that side with that big spear made that hole. Yeah, then yeah, I'll believe. Seems believing, right? So next week, Jesus come back. He's there. And Jesus forgot the knock again, came right through the door, but he went right straight to Thomas. Stood right there to him, and then Thomas knew he had been had because God knows our thoughts. <laughs> I mean, he's just God. I thank God he does. But he said to him, hey, I'm here. Put your hands in there. You know, make sure. I mean, he really was, wasn't foolish enough to, to, to say, well, yeah, well, let me, let me prove that. Now he said, no, no. He fell to his knees and he said, my Lord and my God. But what Jesus said to him has always been a blessing to me. He said, you know, Thomas, you believe because you're here seeing me. But he said, blessed are they in Grace Baptist Church in 2023 who have never seen and yet believe. And you say, Amen. Amen. That's us. That's what he's talking about. That's 
Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So only with that kind of faith can we say with the Apostle Paul, Romans 8, 18, for I can... I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to care compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So walk into the faith, the life of faith is a moment by moment, lifetime commitment. Okay? God is never going to get leave us. He's never going to let us down. He's never going to not be God. He's never going to not do what he says he's going to do. So we have to join the, join the ranks. So the second thing is that the object worthy of genuine faith. So scripture asserts that Jesus is the author and finisher, as we said earlier, of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2. Um, I made myself up a star there, but I don't know why. Isn't that funny? We find things in your notes you didn't remember were there. All right, I'll leave that. If it's important, I'll come back and tell you later. All right. He is the ultimate faith object because he never changes. He is immutable, that word. And remember those who rule or lead over you, this is Hebrews 13, 7, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And then verse 8 said, said right after that, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, I remember what I was going to tell you. Um, years ago when we were replanning the work at Crowley Baptist Church, we put up a new church sign. And as you know, in, in, in 1994, the, uh, the big changes were happening in South Africa. And there was a lot of scary things going on with the uh, government change and the people change and all these different changes. And so the Lord impressed upon me, you need to let the people know there's some things that never change. So guess what verse we put on the new sign? Jesus Christ, the same yesterday today and forever, right? Because that's an unchanging thing. And that's what we get to get hold of in this new year. Okay, so last year's gone and we got some good things out of last year. Maybe we, we also didn't get to accomplish what we should have or could have. But hey, we can't go back and get that. We're right here today and looking forward to keeping God's, doing God's will this year. We'll, we'll get there and I'll give you the, the tools to, to do that in a moment. But when we think about the world's thinking on this, the sun, the physical Sun, sometimes sunny South Africa used to be sunny, but we had a lot of rain, you know. The sun is perhaps the most credible object of faith for the world. It appears to be immutable. It has always been there, 24 hours every day, 365 days a year. Without the sun, people couldn't live. So if the sun didn't rise tomorrow morning, what would happen to the world's faith? It'd be shaken, wouldn't it? All of humanity would be thrown into confusion. If we have such great faith in the sun that shines from time to time, why don't we have as even greater faith in the sun, capital S-O-N, who made the sun and all the rest of the fixed order of the universe? You see, beloved, our faith is in God. Genuine faith is born out of a knowledge of the will of God and exists only to fulfill that will. Faith is not a means of getting man's will done in heaven. It's the means of getting God's will done here on earth. Second thing, faith is dependent upon knowing its object. How much faith we have is determined by how well we know the object of our faith. Ah, going down that road, are you? Well, yeah, why not? The faith, the life of faith is walking in the light. And, and, and what does that great verse in, in, in the Psalm say? The, the uh, uh, Lord, uh, uh, the word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. So faith is dependent on knowing that object. Let me illustrate. When my first son, born son, Christopher, was a year old, I would stand him on the table, back away and tell him to jump into my arms. Right? And he was uneasy at first. <laughs> I'll admit. Then with childlike faith, he leaned forward and fell into my arms. Of course, I caught him. Right? And we'd do that, and, and it was always this. Again, Daddy. Again, Daddy. Just a, <laughs> what did I start? Anyway, so, you know, he got pretty good at it, and then, then we graduated, and then he went to the, the major leagues of jumps. We went outside and got on the low branch of a tree. Now he's got to jump out of the tree. So he did that. It was a little uneasy at first, but, hey, you know, and, you know, as long as I was close enough, I, back then I was taller and stronger. I don't know how that changes. Anyway. I never, uh, it, you know, it seemed to work very well. It was a lot of fun. 
And, and, uh, but, but, um, it, it was a great leap of faith to now jump down from that tree into my arms. Now, here's the thing. Suppose one day I didn't catch him. Do you think he would try again? Probably not. Right? But once faith is lost, it's hard to regain. Stay with me. One act of unfaithfulness in marriage will affect the relationship for years. The hurt spouse can forgive and should forgive and will decide to continue that relationship, but it will take a long time to reestablish the trust that was lost. And I think about that when, when I even get relaxed in my walk with God and I do something that disturbs God and I think, well, I've quenched the spirit in my life. And so I ask the, the, the spirit to fill me. I ask the Lord to forgive me for, for showing that. And I try, to, I try to think of how can I regain these trust? Well, by staying faithful by doing consistently the things he says that will work. And, and boy, it does. It really does. So faith increases through repeated and ever larger steps of faith. It provides the object of faith, it, provided that that object of faith remains faithful. Consider the name of God, the Amen. I like that one. In Revelation 3, 14, it says, And to the angel of the church of the see is right, these things says the Amen, Right? The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, as a personal name of the Lord, the title Amen describes one who perfectly, faithfully, and is faithfully trustworthy. So the God of the Amen is the God of truth, and we can depend on God no matter uh, to remain consistent in an ever-changing world, no matter what happens in 2023. Right? Whatever it brings, it will not stop God's faithfulness. Praise God for that. What about a big God and a big faith? Well, God doesn't change according to how we see him, but there's a sense in which we, some, some today have a little God while others have a big God. What makes the difference? Paul writes, so faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God in Romans 10, 17. So if we have little knowledge of God's word, we will have little faith, right? If we have a lot of knowledge of God's word, we can have a lot of faith. So the heroes of of Hebrews 11 had great faith because they had a great God. Big God, big faith. See how it works? Think about it. If we know and put our trust in seven promises from Scripture, we have a seven promise faith, let's say. But if we know and believe 7,000 promises of Scripture, and I don't think there's that many. Somebody counted them one time, and it was like somewhere between four to 6,000. That's still a lot. But I just... Went over the top here to get, get the point. So if we took 7,000 promises of Scripture, we have a 7K promise faith, you see? So I'm not talking about being super intelligent as though only smart people could have faith. That's not what I'm saying. There are a lot of things in the Bible I don't understand, but I believe them. I don't fully understand the virgin birth, but I believe it. Right? You see, belief is a choice. Believing, uh, uh, we need to choose to believe what we have been convinced is true. Right? Therefore, we believe. And let me quickly add, however, that nobody, including myself, is permanently living, is uh, uh, presently living up to their faith potential. All right? That's why we are to encourage one another in our faith. We are to encourage one another to step out in faith according to what we already know to be true. You see, understanding increases with obedience, and God blesses obedience. So I may not know why God would have me do something, but as I commit myself to doing it, I often understand later. And God sometimes gives you that. That's fantastic. So this is how we know that faith is dependent upon knowing its object, right? So <clears throat> also, if God wants it done, it can be done. Here's a question. If God wants it done, can it be done? And the answer is yes, right? <laughs> so all things are possible for him who believes, Mark 9, 23. But if God wants me to do it, can I do it? Of course. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, right? Philippians 4.13. So what are the all things mentioned in these verses? It, it, is it the miracle of moment living? Can we name it and claim it? No. All things pertain to God's will. God's will is the key. <laughs> what God makes possible is the doing of his will. What he empowers us to do is what he desires to do. So the will of God never leads us where the grace of God cannot enable us. So this life of faith leads us in a uh, walking in the light. And then the last thing is faith results in action. You know, faith 
is an action word. We cannot, we cannot passively respond to God. Right? Because if you're not responding to God, then you, you're actually, you know, let's don't forget that verse in James. For him to know what to do good and do with it not to him is what? Sin. So if you know you're supposed to be doing something, you're not doing it, what is that? Sin. And God doesn't take that lightly, does he? No. So, faith has the same operative dynamic as agape love. When we say that God is love, we are describing his character. Paul says the goal of our um, instruction is love in 1 Timothy 1.5. Therefore, the goal of our Christian education is character transformation to become like Christ. Wow. So if you haven't put all your goals together for the year, the year put that at the top of the list, to become more like Christ in my actions, in my attitudes, the way I think, the way I treat his word as my most valuable treasure, as I memorize it, as I share it, as I pull out that gospel track. I told a girl the other day, I said, you know, Christmas is gone. But look at this. It says, in search of the Savior. Did you know that two months after Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there were some wise men that came from the east to see him. The Bible even says they found him in the house, the child. It's all there. Read about it and believe it. And she said, wow, I've never heard that. That's all it takes is that little, that little interesting little comment to get them to see Jesus. And uh, the sad part is if more of us did it, it wouldn't be so shocking to people. Well, nobody's ever done that to me before. What is this? So my challenge to all of us this year, all of us get busy. Take all my tracks out of the track, up, we'll put more up. It's like the old... Frito-Lay commercials years ago that Jay and Leno used to do. Eat all you want, we'll make more. So take all of them and we'll put more out by God's grace, okay? So, but look at this. When, when the love is used as a verb, it's expressed by action. Best verse. For God so loved the world, he gave. See how he put that in action? John 3, 16. So faith has a similar dynamic. When using faith as a noun, we're talking about what we believe. But if we're talking about faith as a verb, then it is expressed in the way we live. Like James says, if you're going to tell me about your faith, that's one thing. But I want to see it in action. Do something. Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. And that's the only way it's going to work. To God's glory. That's the only way you're going to be in the will of God. Isn't that what Jesus did? It wasn't it's the biggest concern in his in his ministry was to do the will of the Father. He talked about it all the time. Sure, there were other things he wanted to do, but I'm sure he put it on the back back list. He got around to it when he had to, but it was all about doing the will. And when you see his high priestly prayer in John 17, he said, God, Father, I've accomplished what you sent me to do. I've trained up these guys. You want to take the gospel oil when I come home? And he said, I'm, and this was before the cross, and I've already gone to the cross. Wait a minute. He hadn't gone yet. So there was no doubt in his mind he wasn't still going to do the will of God, was it? But even praying in, in the drops of blood in the garden of Gethsemane, if there's any other way, Lord. But no, I'm still willing to be the, the perfect Lamb of God. That is amazing love, isn't it? But well, we've been going around the barn, big red barn. And we're going to come back inside. <clears throat> and in Jude 20, we read it again. But you, beloved, building yourself up to the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. You see, these four important things which go to make up a consistent Christian life, that first one is building up the faith. The second one is praying in the Holy Spirit. We can only do this if we walk in the Spirit. Right? Walk in the Spirit, you're not to build the lust of the flesh. The Bible is very clear about that. Walking in the Spirit is a moment by moment, daily believing and, and walking in the truth, right? It's like the circumspectly thing that, that King James Bible uses is a cool thing because it's, it's like in every area of your life, do it for God's glory. Right? So, um, and we can only do this as we walk in the Spirit. So then he dwells within us 
indicts our prayers, and he guides us as we present our supplications. That's our second thing. So we're building up on the faith. If we're going to have a Christian, Christian life. We've got to be in the Word. We're going to have to pray in the Holy Spirit. Third, we're going to have to keep ourselves in the, in the con conscious enjoyment of God's unchanging love. And that's an interesting thought because Paul wrote in Galatians 5, 13 about a life for service. He said, by love, serve one another. Great man of history, great man of God of prayer was named George Miller. He said this, my business is with all my might to serve my own generation. In doing so, I shall best serve the next generation should the Lord tarry. I mean, he had a long-term view, didn't he? I have been, I have but one life to live. On earth, and this one life is but a brief life for sowing in comparison with eternity for reaping. F. E. Marsh also said that Christ's death is the death of every sin and the life of every virtue, as well as the inspiration to all service. And I, I really appreciate Pastor uh, William Ward also said the pulse of prayer is praise, the heart of prayer is gratitude, the voice of prayer is obedience, the arm of prayer is service. Guys, we're on, on point, weren't they? A couple of other thoughts. Servanthood is getting all excited about helping someone else succeed. It's not about me. It's about you. I'm sharing something God showed me because I want you to succeed in your victorious Christian life this year. And you can do this if you follow his formula. You know, God's, God's way is always the right way. It's just like a candle. Think about it. A candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. Yes. So let's light up for, love, for the Lord this year. Well, the fourth thing of the four important things to have a consistent Christian life is the hope of our Lord's return. Yeah, that blessed hope. You know, and you know, and my radio broadcast is titled The Hope of Glory down in the Caribbean. And by God's grace, we're beginning our 18th year this year. And so thank God for his faithfulness in that getting the gospel there. But you know, the hope of the Lord's return must be kept before our souls as the, as the beacon light which leads us on into the Father's house. You remember what Jesus said in John 14? In my Father's house are many mansions. He said, if it were not so, I would have told you. He said, I go to prepare a place for some of your friends. No, no, what does it say? I go to prepare a place for you. And since I'm going to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. I don't know about you, but that's a nice invitation, isn't it? I can't wait for that. It's coming. It's coming soon, right? Ah, the word, prayer, divine love, and the blessed hope sustain all along the way. And I have a nice little small poem from Pastor Ironside. He said, everlasting arms uphold thee, Love divine, surround thy way. Why should earthly fears distress thee or thy trembling heart dismay? Yeah, he's got a point. Faith is worth the risk, my friends. Faith is worth the risk. There's a story told of a prospector in the first century. Put yourself in his hiking boots for a moment. All right? who had to make a four-day journey across a burning desert. He couldn't carry enough water to make the journey without dying of thirst, but he was assured that there was a well halfway across the desert. So he set out, and sure enough, there was a well right there where the map said. Imagine that. But when he pumped the handle of the well, all he burped up sand. I don't know about you, but when you're thirsty, sand doesn't taste pretty good. Then he saw this sign. Buried. Two feet over and two feet down is a jug of water. The sign said, dig it up, use the water to pump the prime, uh, 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 prime this pump here, drink all the water you want, but when you're done, fill the jug again for the next person. Now, when I was a little boy, my great-grandfather had a place up in, in uh, a suburb of Indianapolis, Indiana, his own farm, and I, I, I loved going up there, but there's two things I hated. Two things. They didn't have indoor plumbing, so they had a spooky old outhouse outside. That was bad. But then they had this old pump water well where you had to go and pump this thing. And the same thing was true. They had a little bucket of water. And you used to have to pour it down that pump before you could 
prime it to get it to go. I can never, as a kid, I could never get out. Why can't you just turn it on like we do it? What's going on? Old things. <laughs> so this sign said, get the bucket, pour it down the well, and it will make the water come up and make sure you drink all you want, and then leave some for the next guy. Now, what would you do if you were dying of thirst? You don't know who wrote that sign. How do you know that guy's just not pouring it out? You could, you could try that pump and it won't work and then you're going to die now. I don't know about you, but tell you the truth, I drink the water that was buried. <laughs> That's what I decided. Because uh, I don't know who wrote that sign on that rusty old pump. But it could be a cruel joke. I'd pour that water down that worthless and then my life would be done. But let me just say, believer, I don't have to worry about things like that when it comes to trusting God. You know why? I know who wrote the sign. And when I pour myself into a life of faith, I know that out of my inner being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus said it himself. God said so. History verifies it. And I, for one, can testify that it's true. In the final analysis, God is not only true, he's right, always. Is faith a risk? Of course. But failing to step out in faith is to risk missing life. Don't know who wrote this, but you got to hear it. It's called risk. To laugh is to risk appearing the fool. To weep is to risk appearing sentimental. To, to reach out for another to risk involvement. To expose feelings is to risk exposing who we really are. To place our ideas or dreams before the crowd is to risk their loss. To love is to risk not being loved in return. To live is to risk dying. To hope is to risk despair. To try is to risk failure. Risks must be taken because the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. <laughs> the person who risks nothing does nothing, has nothing, is nothing. He may avoid suffering and sorrow, but he simply cannot learn, feel, change, grow, love, live. Chained by his servitudes, he is a slave. He has forfeited freedom. What a privilege for us to be able to walk by faith when the object of our faith is God himself and all of the promises of his word that are true. God bless you in this new year. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we love you. We love you. We cannot believe that we could even understand some of this without considering it better. But Lord, you're giving us a big picture window of what this new year is going to be like. With that in mind, I think that we would be best to just trust you and obey. Because like the old song says, with, there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. We want to be that. Help my dear friends here and our pastor and his family and all our leaders here at Grace to really want to be in the will of God, which means that we need to trust you when we don't see the, the means or we don't understand. We also need to be able to step out by faith and go out there and do the work of the ministry and be an ambassador for Christ. Oh, Lord, it's such a privilege. May you bless as only you can. And now as we close our service, and move on uh, to the memorial service with the Lord's table, I pray, Lord, you'll bless in all things. In Jesus' name.